Today I am joined by Yerk P, a uh, Twitter poster, uh, a very original Twitter poster, um, one of my favorite follows, and a person with a very particular sensitivity for what's going on and a very particular way of um, expressing himself. Um, I feel like if if I had to pick out his tweets from like a big pile of anonymized uh, anonymized tweets, I would definitely do a really good job because. Um, it's just that, I don't know, they're very evocative. He's very, you know, I don't want to use the word sensitive, but he's got like his feelers are out for a lot of like very subtle phenomena that are happening. And I feel it's really cool. And I've, I've you know, I've prolonged this intro enough. So, so welcome, uh, Yerk P. Thanks very much. Um, I'm, I'm always happy to be described as sensitive. Oh, that's good. That's good. That's, uh, that's no problem. In, in the nicest sense of the word, because, you know, I'm, I'm in these yeah. kind of manosphere <laughs> circles where, you know, you shouldn't describe someone as sensitive. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. You be accused of calling him a, a simp or an incel. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We wouldn't, wouldn't want that. No, no. <laughs> and actually, I mean, one of the things I wanted to, to talk to you about um, and that people have been asking me to talk to you about uh, is about this incel phenomenon. I know you've, you've mm -hmm. written, you've gotten a, quite a few, you know, circular spats about, about w what an incel is. Oh, yeah. Um, and I've, I've also commented on the incel phenomenon, but it's still, it's still really interesting um, to, to see it from from you know multiple perspectives as you have because you know people just believe that you know incels are people who are involuntarily celibate they live in their mother's basement they play games yeah. they're, they're off the grid and they're also kind of this, <coughs> i don't know this category that we we shall not speak about in in positive terms so I know, what's what's your what's your vibe about incels are they a modern scapegoat or what's what's their purpose yeah it's very interesting i've been thinking about the kind of incel phenomenon for a while and it, it seems to me that it's kind of like a it's part of a sort of internet folklore um and it's like a more recent example of of internet folklore and th i think there have been others i mean the guy in his basement archetype is like very old um and probably goes back a kind of long time uh, internet wise um but what's always really struck me about it is how um, the sort of, uh, well, I suppose I'm going to generalize here, but like the media people or, you know, the sort of blue check industrial complex um, have always seemed to sort of take incels at face value, you know, rather than seeing them as this kind of folkloric construction um, that obviously overlaps with reality in various ways. Obviously, there are, there are people who kind of identify with that label to different, degree, uh, different degrees, and there are kind of loose communities, you know, uh, or have been at different times of people who kind of conceive of themselves in this way. So uh, like a lot of online identities, there's a degree of self-fulfilling prophecy to it. But it's interesting to me that no one um, seems to want to put them into a kind of social context you know uh, no one seems to want to examine them as the product of the culture they've grown up in uh, i mean the people who actually do have these kinds of problems and who are drawn to this kind of identification um there's this like idea that they've just like sprung up out of nowhere um and people are very happy to sort of accept this like implicitly meritocratic frame um that they're basically just romantic failures who um, resent women and kind of resent society. And that seems like such a cartoonish, superficial, you know, you're really like taking them at face value and at their word, really, and assuming that this kind of um, self mythologization that they're engaged in is, you know, <laughs> completely the whole story of what's been going on. And actually, you know, it, it's just obvious that masculinity is kind of in crisis and that um, there's just tremendous false consciousness about um, how relationships between men and women work, I think. Um, I mean, I've experienced that in, in my own life and almost every other guy I know who's around my age has experienced that. And we've all navigated it in different ways, you know, and you kind of gradually um 
sort of piece together the, <laughs> the truth of things. Um, and so you have to look in sort of uh, forbidden territories at these kind of like cargo cult attempts at reconstructing uh, sort of essential truths about relationships um, that because they've been denied by the broader culture, they've resurfaced in a kind of slightly um, uh, like hostile and resentful form. You know, I mean, that's how I see a lot of like uh, red pill stuff. You know, uh, I'm not wild about the kind of Evo psych dimension to it because it seems very like uh, very cold. Um, but yeah. there's obviously something there that is that resonates with people and resonates with people's experiences. Yeah, I and feel that they're like... not finding acknowledgement of elsewhere. Yeah, absolutely. And I feel like Evo psych is probably the language that that people can still communicate about it in. Um, because it kind of has this veneer of science when essentially, Absolutely. yeah, e Evo Psych yeah. is, you know, the lying eyes school of dating. Um, yeah. What we all knew until yesterday. And then now we just have this, this cool explanation like, oh, you know, when we live, when we were in caves, we used to do the same thing. Oh, really? Okay. Well, then yeah. <laughs> and that makes sense. Um, it's, and it's also, I've seen this, this label insult thrown around a lot as kind of the one of the last legitimate forms of of insults and slurs it's it's mm. coming up more and more i see like you know from from like especially from woke women um if they want to shut up someone in an, in an internet beef they just say oh yeah you incel and yeah yeah i don't know it's it's it feels like it, it's just not <laughs> I mean, one, it's not an argument, but I don't want to sound like Stefan Molyneux. <laughs> <laughs> but it's also, um, I don't know, it's it's really childish. Like you're just kind of calling someone, you know, un unlucky in love or sexless or something. Uh, yeah, I mean, which also betrays the kind of anxiety of the worldview that, that they subscribe to. Um, and I, I think that's also a big part of it, really, which is that... Um, the culture we all inhabit now is so like acquisitive and, and kind of competitive in a way that it overtly uh, denies being. Um, so we're in this like this kind of hedonist culture where there's really, there's really nothing to fight for or nothing to do, nothing constructive really to do. There's just sort of these passing moments of pleasure. And so everybody has to try and get as many, uh, get as much like, um, just pure libidinal uh, like pleasure out of life as they can before they die. There's nothing transcendent and it inspires this kind of like terrible um, sort of envy and this anxiety that other people may be enjoying themselves more than you and maybe having like better experiences than you um, or, you know, we'll be having more sex than you, which is obviously that's like an eternal human anxiety as well, but it's, it's very acute. Um, at the moment, because it's so sort of inflected with this, um, this kind of desperate acquisitiveness. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, it's interesting to me how, you know, because because we're this global market, and, and, you know, every, every facet of our lives is has is reflected in the market in some way, or at least is reflected back at us in, in yeah. some refined way to, you know, extract value or, you know, give us value or create create desires in us. Um, I, I remember you, you commented on on only fans and kind of like this, this new uh, category of sex worker. Um, and I know OnlyFans, you know, is not a big as big of a phenomenon as, as you know, at least my corner of Twitter tries to make it. But I feel like it's very symptomatic of, of this highly refined, like parasocial, um, you know, we we sell you your normality back to you uh, in like mm. these weird fragments of, like you said, you know, libidinal um, impulse, and. Um, yeah. And it's always, I don't know, it's its never really total humanity that you get back. It's just like some some weird uh, super normal version of a subset of stimuli that you would get from, you know, being married or having having a, a yeah, relationship with yeah. a human being. Um, and I thought that was really insightful. And I remember, I think there was a woman who was either a spokesperson for sex workers or a sex worker herself, but she was like, she wasn't having it. She didn't, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> didn't want to hear about it. Um, yeah, that's happened a few times, I think. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, that's the thing about, like, I mean, OnlyFans, 
it strikes me that even on a sort of like you know like looking at it from the point of view of this like Rabelaisian kind of like uh you know Thelema attitude of like oh you know let's just enjoy ourselves and have a good time it seemed strikingly kind of antiseptic and sterile and sort of um like de-eroticized you know it seems kind of like a you know the the fact that you're like looking at women seems almost like purely vestigial mm. uh at this point it's like they're they're kind of almost incidental to the whole the whole process of what's going on you know it's so kind of um mechanized um yeah. i don't know i mean you know it may not be it may all of us on twitter it may kind of because it it tends to show up in the timeline um or just something that we're more ambi ambiently aware of because it's sort of sharing this weird online space we're all in so it might be that we give <laughs> um it, it sort of haunts us more than it should do yeah, <laughs> maybe, yeah, that's maybe. What I think. yeah for sure for sure i mean um, yeah, there, there's some people who are extremely popular on Twitter who are involved with OnlyFans, so I'm, I could imagine. Yeah, why. it's kind of a, a flashpoint for for these anxieties to do with every, everybody kind of being sort of atomized and you know the whole bug world um, thing because it's sort of it's one of the most sort of noticeable and clear examples of that that thing kind of appearing in the present, um, and so I think it has a kind of uh, there's a sort of fear that it's like the herald of, you know, a new way of being entirely, or one herald of that new way of being, that's kind of um, sort of more and more appearing in our own world. Yeah, and I feel like this uh, this is something that a, a, a good corner of, of you know of thinking people applaud or at least welcome or see as the next step. You know, kind of the, yeah. the tra transhumanist. You know. Um, extension like I've, I've even heard you know economists like Tyler Cowen say this is the, this is the inevitable future we're going to have a, a cast of you know high you know maybe yeah. the sub, sub one percent who's going to be uh, kind of almost anarcho primitivist and the rest are going to just be hooked up to sensors and drooling in their in their pods um, and to me that sounds pretty terrible <laughs> and I, yeah the inevitability of it is I'm not into it. No, no. Narco primitivism for all, I say. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, no, it's very, like, it's very sinister, actually. That I mean, um, you know, it just seems very obvious to me, like, social media was accompanied by a lot of, like, um, utopian kind of messaging, you know, um, especially, like, early on. And now it's like 10 years later and, you know, I don't know if, if this is a kind of distortion, it probably is, but the online landscape is so sort of like permeated by trauma and anxiety and sort of disassociation and dread, you know, um, and it just seems to be the case. People are kind of lonelier. People have less hope in the future. I mean, there are a lot of reasons for that, um, but it just seems clear at this point that the whole the whole thing has been a terrible mistake, you know. But every time a new sort of technological development is announced in the news, it seems to be in this like um, this tone of inevitability, you know, like mm. this is coming. Um, get used to it. You yeah. Know? Yeah, I mean, um, even even in media, if you if you look at what you know what what would have been the most popular forms of of I don't know uh, sci-fi recently, it's a lot of like crazy dystopian stuff like Black Mirror. Oh, what a what a you know magical creation, or even even the Matrix or things like that. It's like, oh, okay, so which one of these pod futures is going to be ours? And um, I don't know. It's 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 quite weird how people just take it for granted, and I feel like that kind of plays yeah. into the yeah. People are very disempowered about about their lives in general. Like the idea that anyone could opt out of this um, doesn't really yeah it doesn't really ring true to most people. Yeah, I mean, I think that's the sort of the trad ideal, which um, 
kind of became very popular on here for a while. And, and you know, again, that's something that like answers a, a sort of deep need I think people have to um, imagine uh, some kind of exit from this um, this future that's kind of been decided for us, you know, and it's been decided for us by uh, this kind of mysterious, like, you know, it, it's just, I mean, you think about the way people encounter um, news now, you know, it's just in this, like, endless flow of, of data and information. Uh, and it's, unless you kind of dedicate a substantial effort to researching it very carefully, it just appears as like waves within, you know, one, one big thing. Um, and it's hard to attribute it to anything. You know, it seems to, these things seem to just arrive on our screens kind of out of a, a it's just a huge sort of technological unconscious, you know, yeah. um, so there's not a lot to sort of do about them. Um, yeah, and there's there's no centralized authority that you know creates a script of of how this stuff is going to be. You know. Yeah, yeah. It comes down the pipe. It's it's all very emergent from, yeah, from you know, almost this kind of religious, you know, very ancestral thing that's brewing underneath the the conscious. Uh, of everyone and then everyone kind of participates in creating this this egregore that you know then everyone else on the other side is oh, yeah. shocked at like how how did this come to be but you know there's i don't think there's like a cabal of people um you know thinking about you know how to mm. how to craft a message and the message crafts itself crafts itself after after a while yeah i mean like kind of um the topic of conspiracy theory is a sort of good example of this because there'll be like uh you know, you can find like USA Today articles from like 2017. Uh, like there's one that's called something like, you know, you, <laughs> you will be chipped, you know, or, um, you know, like chip, microchip implants are coming. Um, and it's, it's in the context of like, um, you know, like tech companies, uh, like um, keeping tabs on their employees. Um, but, you know, obviously now um, that's a kind of conspiracy theorist um, classified anxiety of like, oh, the vaccines will have microchips in them. Um, but there was one time when this was being like, you know, the, the, just the concept of microchip implants was kind of mainstream enough um, to appear in this, this like article in the, you know, in USA Today that wasn't exactly friendly about them. <laughs> you know it's kind of like this hostile tone of like you know it's, it's coming whether or not you like it um but now that it's become sort of inconvenient um during the sort of covid era the idea of like microchip implants is kind of taboo suddenly and it's sort of um it's kind of been tagged as like misinformation you know so something that was once plausible um has become unspeakable and you know no one really has any power or, or control or access to who decides these things there is just a sort of um, consent manufacturing process that you can observe in real time but you're always on the outside of it yeah and if you object to it then you're you know you you run the risk of becoming a conspiracy theorist yeah and you know what's what's going on right now is, is even more interesting I, I don't know if you've uh, had the chance to read that time article or if you've read about it and uh cause a lot i was people... just reading it <laughs> just, yeah, just so before this yeah it's very interesting because at the moment essentially you have um you know like uh, i think it was michael anton celebration parallax it's kind of that thing where you have to um, not only is this not going on, but when you find out that it is going on, it's the best thing that ever happened. Um, yeah. you know, it's, it's, and it's really depends. Like at the same time, you know, people are talking in neutral terms about this on the right and they're getting stickers like, oh, this is a disputed situation, but they're essentially, you know, quoting almost verbatim from the article, um, yeah. <laughs> which is essentially an article gloating that, uh, a, a cabal of, you know, media, political, you know, real cabal. 
a real cabal. It actually says cabal <laughs> in, the, yeah. in the article, um, and it's all just like chest beating about how they how they orchestrated and changed laws and and you know d directed the the, the 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 flow of information to to yeah. guarantee the the Biden victory. Um, <laughs> I mean, from from anyone uh, anyone from this position, I mean, from, from my position, I'm I'm more on the right, obviously. Um, it's 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 quite a shocker, but I'm curious how someone within you know someone who's who's a lefty would would read that article and how they they would interpret it. Probably not the way I have. I mean, it's you know it's you know they just yeah. say, oh, nice, good for them. <laughs> Yeah, well, there's this kind of irony that, you know, the sort of pretext for why all of this happened in the first place is this belief that Trump would dispute the election based on the fact that he thought forces were conspiring against him. And so, again, it's a kind of self-fulfilling prophecy that they were, they were like, oh, well, yeah, in that case, we should all conspire against him to ensure, you know, that democracy will be free from... Uh, the threat of Trump believing that he's being conspired against. <laughs> exactly. Fortified. I love yeah. the, the new word for it. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, I think there's a kind of thing where, where it's like uh, Alex Jones talking about like the frogs being turned gay um, by chemicals in the water supply, mm -hmm. which is, you know, it just um, is true. <laughs> um, but, you know, it, it's like, if, if Alex Jones is talking about it, then by definition, it can't be true because he's such a sort of extreme persona, you know? Um, a lot of this is just to do with the kind of persona that people have online, you know? And like, there's an NPR persona, you know, there's like a liberal persona and they have like these aestheticized qualities associated with them of being rational or reasonable or caring about facts. But, you know, the, their actual relationship to all of those things is kind of um, no better or worse than anybody's, really. And they're just as prone to kind of hysteria and emotionalism as anybody. Um, but it, it's sort of, again, it's a kind of, it's a kind of internet folklore. You know, it, it might not be recognized as such to the extent that incels um, obviously are. But... Um, I guess this, you know, this is another thing. It's like identity online. That's a slightly different area, but it's it's related. Um, but I think they feel that it's if it's real, then by definition it can't be a conspiracy theory. And if it's not a conspiracy theory, then it can't be bad, because conspiracy theories are always bad, and they're always outlandish. Mm -hmm. um, and I th I'm sure that lots of people you know, participating in this enormous collective effort that's described in that time article wouldn't conceive of themselves as conspiring. You know, I th I'm sure that when they describe it in the article as a conspiracy, it's a kind of, um, a lot of people will read that in a sort of, uh, sort of self-deprecating or ironic way <laughs> in regards yeah. to themselves, you know, um, and kind of miss that it's actually just true. <laughs> Yeah, I feel like the, the, the whole world is, is one big Russell conjugation now where, you know, <laughs> I'm firm, you're obstinate, and it's just you can't really break out of that um, kind of in-group, out-group perspective. Mm. And you can even see this with, with COVID, you know, it, it took a little while until the side stabilized on COVID because I feel like, you know, the, the right, especially the online right, was really early on COVID. They were, I think, early on yeah. masks. They were, you know, and, and that was kind of the, the, the online right aesthetic, like, okay, there's this thing happening, China is bad. Um, until they until they stabilized on the message, you know, people weren't, they didn't make it a, a religious observance to wear your six, six masks or whatever <laughs> the, the trend is now. Um, but now it's it's solidified. It's clear, you know, who the enemy is, you know, what they do, what they mm. don't do, who we are. And it's it's quite interesting to see that, you know, to see that happen in real time and to see the message just like morph into and, and kind of crystallize <laughs> before our eyes. Yeah, yeah. And there's sort of like deference towards the, the figure of the expert, uh, which is another example of like of folklore, really, uh, in the way it's kind of used now. Um, you know, like this idea of expertise that's like really outside of any other kind of 
social context and is a kind of immune to any kind of bias or like political agenda, you know, and it is always just this sort of absolute that can be turned to at any time, even though it's, you know, contents within itself are always sort of changing and the processes by which it's arrived at are also, you know, opaque to the average person, which is not, you know, that's not a, a scientific attitude. Um, it's a kind of, um, quasi religious attitude. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And, uh, that's another thing I wanted to ask you about, uh, about facts, which is a big word yeah. on the internet, especially on the, on the left. Um, the idea that, okay, we have the facts, we are the party of science with a big S. Um, and yeah. there's, there are people who have the facts and people who don't have the facts, which, um, I feel like is completely contrary to the to the nature of you know what what a fact is um it's it's, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's very it's quite subjective sometimes uh, and i remember i think there was this this highly you know um talked about thing by by kellyanne conway where she said we have alternative facts and i thought that was that was probably one of the, the truer things said during the 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 trump presidency because <laughs> it, it is true i mean um, just having a little bit of a different perspective essentially gives you a different set of facts because, you know, yeah, yeah. just your perception, you know, shifting, you, you observe different things, you put different things together in different ways. Um, I, I wonder what, what your, um, kind of what your feeling is about, about this. Um, I feel like they're, they're also ratcheting up the discourse on facts now, you know, we have, the yeah, well, it, yeah, it's, it's useful because it's sort of, again, the expertise thing is part of a kind of like there's this established binary between expertise and then misinformation and misinformation has become the new sort of pretext for online censorship um so they're pushing it very hard right now uh but you can kind of also trace it back to um the fact that you know the the liberal political vision is a really like a sort of technocratic managerial one um at the moment and it's and it's also kind of, um, it's sort of proceduralist, you know, it's like, this is the sort of accepted way of doing things. We can just stick to this. This is the sort of evidence. This is the data we've collected that supports why this is the best policy to use or, you know, and it, it kind of evades the question of ideology altogether, uh, evades the question of values. Um, and you can see that in something like an issue like abortion, you know, where the, the sort of like, um, pro-choice rhetoric is often, uh, you know, it's like using this idea that like, oh, you know, a fetus is or isn't um, a person at such and such a, a, you know, a time. And that's a factual thing, you know, <laughs> rather than a kind of a, a question that refers back to all kinds of, um, you know, ethical and sort of spiritual moral implications you know, that, that people are very serious about and for good reason. Um, so it's sort of convenient to have this political worldview that's like absent of values altogether almost. Um, and it's just, well, does this thing directly hurt anybody? No, then it's fine. Um, and everything else is just a sort of um, an organizational question, you know. Um, so I think that, you know, people have a, a very deep investment in this, like this idea of politics that doesn't demand anything of them. That doesn't make them, um, doesn't ask them to seriously uh, evaluate themselves in any way, morally. Um, it's just this kind of, uh, You know, it's something that can be left to the experts in a way. So the average person uh, doesn't doesn't have to worry about it. It's all being taken care of. Um, yeah, that, I mean, this is this is definitely something that you see in in you know all areas of life. Um, There's another kind of conversation about um, a post about sex being just like like eating, and it's just like a, a yeah yeah physical compulsion and whatever mystifications you want to add to it that's on you because it's essentially just like i don't know like burping. yeah yeah you should you should yeah 
emotionality out of it and i feel like that's any, kind of any uh, significance that you add to sex is just your kind of free prerog prerogative in the um in the kind of marketplace yeah you know yeah and it, it, it's interesting what happened sorry what are you gonna say no i'm just i'm just gonna say that uh you know i feel like this is the, the the biggest crime that this perspective has is that it's it's focused on the individual it's like oh i i am the one having sex i it's, it's very instrumental i'm i use yeah. the other person um my my perspective is the only one that matters uh when when you essentially you never know how where you stand with the other person you know maybe yeah, they're yeah. maybe they're spiritually invested in sex and you're just essentially burping on them because that's your you know physical <laughs> <laughs> impulse but it's you know that that's that to me is, is quite i don't know quite morally mm. repugnant to just you know dispense with any morality in sex because you know that's that's how it should be. <laughs> yeah, and again, to to reduce the moral dimension of it down to the question of consent, which I think has caused a great deal of problems for people. Um, I mean, I, I think, you know, it's interesting to, to consider what happened with sex, um, with the sort of history of, like, the sexual revolution in the 60s and, um, and the, the ideas of sort of sexual liberation. I think um there was a sense maybe back then of sort of um social institutions uh having become kind of like shells that were containing this um energy that wanted to escape you know and so there are all these sort of social movements um that were you know had this ideology of expanding people's personal freedom and introducing them to pleasure and all, all, all this kind of thing, which obviously there, are, you know, you can critique that from a, a number of angles, but it also obviously happened. Um, and I don't doubt that it was a sort of true experience for some people, but it seems that what's happened um, further down the line now is that energy has kind of exhausted itself. Um, and those sort of, you know, <laughs> um what those institutions that are once sort of containing shells are really just like husks now you know um but all of that sort of vital energy has kind of completely dissipated um and any energy that's left is just like soaked up by things like only fans and by like the the availability of of porn online you know and no one is really <laughs> sleeping with anybody anymore yeah um it, you know it, it's also sort of like it's miserable really but um yeah. it it feels it, to me like it, it follows the the pattern of um of a classical addiction um i mean i, I haven't yeah. been addicted to many things but i, I was addicted to, to cigarettes for a, a short time quite quite intensely and it was very interesting to observe it going from oh this is you know a pleasurable experience to I am a junkie. I will wake up one hour earlier just so I can have my five cigarettes in the morning. And it was yeah. just kind of just being chained to ratcheting up the habit. Uh, and it just, you know, you kind of just need more and more and more stimulus to get to a place where you're miserable um, just because you'd be much more miserable if you didn't have it. Yeah. So I, I see this pattern playing out in so many things from even from, you know, from eating from, you know, all, all sorts of super normal stimuli that we're bombarded with uh, from every industry, you know, and, and porn is like the, the quintessential one, like, you know, how many people have erectile dysfunction or all sorts of problems yeah. with, with sexuality because of porn. Um, it's it's not just you know it's it's not a neutral good it's not like oh you know they're they're not having sex so they're just going to watch some porn you know it's it's it really is a i mean i was going to say really crotchety but it's it's a corrupting influence <laughs> <laughs> so i don't know it's um yeah i mean if you try and you know be hedonistic and you just indulge all of your impulses you know you quickly realize um, well, I mean, I guess a lot of people don't. <laughs> well, hopefully you do. You know, is that you realize it kind of really doesn't lead anywhere. It, it kind of leads inwards, uh, just further and further inwards into kind of nothing. And you're not actually releasing anything into the world or creating anything new. Um, is It really is just this sort of like, uh, like cascading exhaustion. <laughs> 
<laughs> you know, that just gets worse and worse. Uh, I think that's really, that might be the kind of fundamental structure of bad things in general, is they kind of, it's like a, a sort of nothingness eating itself into existence. That probably sounds a bit dramatic. But oh, I like it. I, like I really it. do think that's probably, you know, the, the structure of most bad, bad things. That's this is horrible. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, just eating away at a kind of potential. Um, yeah, and, and it, I, it, it gets you like with, with every iteration, it gets hungrier. That's that's kind of yeah. the problem. It does really ratchets up, and at right. some point, it, you can't stop. Yeah, that's a very significant aspect of it because um you're sort of feeding this desire for attention with, with attention and what happens is the desire gets bigger and i think people confuse um sort of acting on the impulse of a desire with um sating it you know i think satiety uh, which is a difficult word to say is a very very different thing from the sort of impulsive, um, impulsive acting on desire, you know, maybe the, the better word would be fulfillment. I think, you know, we have all these things like porn and video games and drugs and stuff, and it, it doesn't really fulfill us, you know, no one's fulfilled by it. Um, but I also think that we're in denial of that because these things are very easy. And once you're in the habit of them, they exert a significant, power of your life and because our culture is so focused on individual effort um you know no one wants to admit that they have a, a kind of a problem with these things um, and also there's this added pressure that if you admit that you have a problem with something that everybody else seems to be enjoying you appear to be threatening to invalidate their own use of those things by suggesting that it isn't just free choice, you know, that they've made, you know, without with, free of any kind of external or internal pressure. Exactly. Um, yeah, it, it feels to me like a, a lot of these movements that are now quite supported by by woke capital are, are based on this, you know, all these uh, kind of newfangled social justice movements, like um, fat acceptance and, and things like that. It feels to me like, okay, we've made society quite dysfunctional through this, you know, through these iterative supernormal stimuli that you find in food, this hyper palatable slop that we get in every type of food. Yeah. Uh, and now we're like, okay, we are not going to try to focus uh, on the root cause, which is this, you know, this destructive food that we're producing. We're going to just try to integrate these, you know, this, these yeah. de deformed people into their own social justice uh, coalitions niche. and niche. Yeah. And then it's, it's, it's quite, it's quite dystopian. It's like, okay, we deformed you and now we're going to pay for parades and, and, you know, magazine yeah. covers and all this stuff just so to, to make you feel good. But also, it doesn't make you feel good. Uh, that's the thing. It's 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 an empty it's an empty yeah. move. And you, I believe that you can kind of see that when you, I mean, and this may be just me being judgmental, but I I believe you can kind of see it in the temperament of, you know, of a lot of people who argue for things like uh, fat acceptance. Is, you know, I I sort of believe that there's a part of them deep down that's very repressed that would like to be sort of um seriously told no <laughs> you know i i think that's a, another kind of taboo thing um at the moment it's just the idea that like anybody would be told no to the, the desire to satisfy an impulse you know immediately to, to to have immediate gratification from things um i think there's a kind of hunger that people have and don't recognize within themselves because it's so foreign to them to to <laughs> be told no um and there's a kind of yearning for it yeah. i think you could see that with like jordan peterson who obviously is not a perfect thinker um but the neurosis that he inspired amongst again kind of pmc people like uh, kind of media people was astonishing because when you go and you know, listen to him speak or read his book or whatever. You just think this is so benign. 
how could anybody think that this guy was a kind of fascist you know um yeah and there was this desire to attribute his success to like angry young men or yeah or whatever guilt by association they've i've never heard an argument against peterson that wasn't some form of guilt by association like oh did you see who he hangs out with he has a photo of this guy with him um never really talking about his arguments except maybe for a few of his spicier takes on the lobster thing yeah iconic yeah but that was that's that's quite cute and i don't think it's very informed in in biology but it was yeah it's a nice (laughs) symbol um but i think it was his comments about i think women were wearing makeup in the workplace i think that really rubbed a lot of people the wrong way yeah Um, yeah but you know he's 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 a super benign character um, you know, I, I really enjoy his work. I feel like he's just been definitely a, a big motivation for me, just just by the fact that he was so ballsy to just go out there and say no. He was, I think that that was the thing that made him famous. He looked these people in the eye, these people that everyone is afraid afraid of, the people slaying the racisms, the bigots, the sexists, and said no. He said no like a stern father, and you know everyone got chills down their spines. Oh my God, what yeah. was that? <laughs> well, it, you know. It, he, I, I don't know, I'm maybe like lowering my stock by talking about him because he doesn't seem to be that popular anymore. But I mean, nah. <laughs> I um, I think there was something kind of um, you, you know, I think you read him, you should go on and read um, like slightly deeper thinkers. I think you know, I think he is a good stepping stone. But there was something very compelling about him because, like, I think he spoke to a kind of uh, voice inside us all that kind of says like. When you're doing something wrong, it says that you, you know you know that you're doing something wrong, and you should stop. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I think it's a part of us that again, you know, it's been repressed for so long, and it's something we're encouraged to ignore. Exactly, and it's it's just I think it's you know like you know he talks about archetypes a lot, and I feel like you know there there is a certain archetype that's been missing in in, in our culture, and that's essentially kind of the yeah. The ben- benign father, you know, the, yeah. the, the dominant man, the, 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 the masculine energy. And then we've, you know, we spend so much time with the devouring mother that, you know, that's that's the only reality we know. And when someone's just, you know, straight talking you into leading a good life, it's it's quite the shock. <laughs> Cause... Especially if you've never, you know, or only rarely heard that before from other people, especially for young men, um, because, you know, it's an expression of care and it's like an expression of love and a desire for somebody to succeed and i you know, i really think the people who reacted uh to peterson so badly they're kind of emblematic of a, a culture that like launders its indifference as um tolerance you know i think a lot of people are very a lot of young people especially are very deeply wounded by the indifference of the culture around them and its refusal to try and set any uh, limits or boundaries for them and its refusal to give them any judgment. And that is so often framed as a kind of positive thing with this idea that judgment is so terrible, but you know, without uh, negative judgment, you can't have positive judgment either. And so no one really knows what to be, or, you know, what, what anyone's expectations of them are. And everyone is left kind of floundering you know which isn't a fun state to be in yeah absolutely and that's you know it's it it does feel like um what they're trying to do is just to create a situation where everything is a positive you know any sort of defect or uh but essentially what, what what it does is it you know it's kind of like when they started instituting um, prizes for for all you know for all kids in in middle school or whatever, uh, everyone knows that it's it's phony. So it just debases the whole the whole hierarchy. Um, it doesn't it doesn't really uh, encourage the people at the bottom because they know it's phony. It discourages the people at the top because they are like, okay, this isn't a competition anymore. Um, and it just rips the incentives out from any sort of you know any sort of morality yeah. in in the, in the society. So. Yeah, it's it's quite yeah quite dystopian. I mean, you know, asking everybody to be their own kind of like founder of their own moral universe is like a tremendous amount of pressure pressure to exert on people, especially like teenagers. <laughs> um, 
yeah, yeah. you know um i don't think everybody can do that and i don't think they should be expected to you know i think people have a right to you know expect um judgments from people and, and a right to expectations about themselves and uh what they can achieve you know yeah especially um, if, the, if those judgments um you know they typically bake in some form of wisdom like you know people yeah. don't want their daughters to be prostitutes you know for a, typically a good reason now we could look at you know what exactly the, this reason is but it's it's probably going to be good for the individual woman and it's also probably going to be good for the community that surrounds her if she doesn't end up a prostitute so uh, th these things you know we could you know we could look at them scientifically we could take our, our magnifying glass but there is a reason for this yeah. and depriving people of this you know just by saying oh you know sex work th this year 2020 we've decided it's absolutely fine you should do it it's a side game and yeah any like opposition to it is just the, the result of this like archaic construction that there's no use for anymore um which is like you know it's dismaying um because yeah i think that's something that happens a lot really is that people have this view of things being socially constructed that it means that they're basically irrelevant and interchangeable and they can kind of be removed and that once you've removed all these like pieces of archaic junk away there'll be some kind of pure authentic uh reality underneath where everybody is their true self and actually i think what you just find is there's nothing that's just a resounding absence um and no no one knows who they are um or what they should do exactly and it, it it's because like you know we've taken this kind of scientific attitude and the, the whole expertise thing and the facts thing ties into this that like um you know all that matters is the sort of like objective surface of the physical world that we encounter you know like where objects are <laughs> and things like that um and then once we've established all of that we can just throw everything else away and you know i i don't think people realize that all of these like these um huge kind of moral systems uh, that exist within, um, you know, within the like history of our civilization and all, um, within the Western canon and within, uh, the great religions, you know, it, it was responding to something real. Um, I believe it was responding to something real, you know, and it, it's not about establishing where things are in space. Uh, that's a complete misdirection. It's about, um finding a sort of transcendent source to root your understanding of how things should be in and i just think we, we just don't have that um culturally um there's a sort of uh fear of it you know mm -hmm. um absolutely and i i feel like there's just another layer to this, which is just the, the, the factor of social coordination, you know, where, um, you know, the, this, this new system that we're in kind of treats the individual. And I, I believe the individual is an important, you know, level of abstraction, yeah. but it's not the only level of abstraction. And uh, it, it treats the individual as, okay, this is the place where things happen. Um, but the problem is, I'm not, I don't live in a, in a void, you know, there are all sorts of mimetic effects that happen when I do something or you do yeah. something or we're in the same network. Um, and also, you know, the, the purpose of society is to perpetuate itself. You know, whatever people say, and I know there's a big, you know, anti-natalist movement kind of yeah. looming, but it's, um, you know, that a society should have norms, should have, you know, stigma, should have all sorts of uh, nudges baked into it, guardrails that w are there to ensure its its propagation, its continuation, yeah. at least. Uh, we don't have that anymore. And I feel like that's that's um, what's that called? The great filter, <laughs> at least at least at the, at the level of a society. <laughs> no, that's it. Um, so I think it's it's a super, super concerning because, you know, there's nothing to account for that level. Absolutely yeah. nothing. Uh, well, I think what happens is that it's a sort of, um, it's a kind of great averaging of perceptions about things. 
So going back to what I was saying earlier about this kind of like the energy of sexual liberation that's that's dissipated, you know, what what what's happened now is we just have the the empty vessel that contained all of the energy. Um and now it's like there could be more energy, but I don't think we really want there to be. I think it's sort of too too dangerous and you know, and I think actually where you find that energy now is in like, um, not to sort of flatter myself, but like weird, you know, weird Twitter anons uh, and people like that. That's the sort of like real, um, where the kind of countercultural cultural force has like paradoxically arrived at, you know. Um, it's, you know, and it's unrecognized as such by everybody. Um, I think it's like it's now it's like well we've you know we know what like it looks like when we just let all of this energy escape I don't think about things purely in terms of en energy by the way but it's just a convenient metaphor for this kind of dimension of what I'm talking about um but now it's time to try and shape it into something positive and constructive for the future and that requires actual discipline you know and it requires judgment. It requires the ability to make judgments about your own choices and about your own experiences. Um, and I think that's like, that's the real, it's a, a large, very large element anyway of this kind of um, countercultural moment on Twitter, you know, of people rediscovering this like capacity to make judgments about things and to notice things about the world and about relationships that are there is no acknowledgement of you know yeah. otherwise yeah no noticing yeah. intensifies <laughs> yeah yeah but i i have to agree with you i mean that's kind of what uh, attracted me to to twitter in the first instance and to Same. yeah to this this corner of twitter in particular um i remember someone sent me uh i think it was uh just offline like a thread by by zero hp lovecraft and i was like I really need to go on Twitter. <laughs> this is really <laughs> interesting. So yeah, yeah, the rest is history. Um, yeah, and I, I'm I'm really curious because I, to be honest, I see a lot of people who are you know master of the universe types orbiting this space, listening to these conversations, popping into the the clubhouse chat rooms, um, you know, subscribing to Substacks of the this dissident corner. Um, so, so kind of the, the people who are in in the tech elite, at least, less so probably the media elite. There is a, a bit of overlap there as well. Um, mm. They're paying attention to the space. You know, they're paying attention to accounts with you know a couple of thousand followers. Um, there, there is they're 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 listening. They're lurkers. Uh, I know. I, I I see them sometimes. You know, they they pop up in in, in weird ways, <laughs> and you're like, whoa, hey, <laughs> what are you doing here? So you know, people know important people some important people know that there's that there's truth truth work going on here it, it might be clad in in the in the irreverent uh, style of memes and, and shit posting um but it's definitely a hot spot for for truths and, and there's a lot of people talking about you know um the only way a, an elite is going to fizzle out is if there is a rise of a counter elite who has a different form of truth that they're going to use to be the cornerstone of their of their you know their new truth truth empire um you know <laughs> this this is me flattering myself now and flattering flattering <laughs> us us the people in this corner but um there's definitely interest in it um and you know ho hopefully it's at least you know part of like a seed for um a new way of thinking because at least there's a lot of interest in this stuff as well i mean that's why i started a podcast as well you know people yeah. want to talk about this stuff um, it's not mainstream, you know, I know I have a bit of, um, an echo chamber effect here that I have to, <laughs> have to rein in, but, you know, there, there is, there is quite a lot of, um, a lot of movement in the space, you know, and it's attractive. It's, it's got a magnetism. I don't know. Yeah. What's, what's your vibe about it? Um, I mean, I, I suppose, you know, I, I'm also, uh, kind of a late comer to it and I'm, I'm sure there are people who feel like there was a kind of vibrancy to it that's been lost. And I know <laughs> there are people who are kind of, um, you know, don't like each other anymore or, you know, and I'm, I'm sort of in the midst of, of that. Um, 
and just kind of trying to like more or less politely get along with everybody um because i still find that you know everybody has interesting things to say um i guess you know i really um i kind of joined twitter because there were people i wanted to sort of talk to and i wanted to participate in this little kind of nebulous thing that i saw going on and there are lots of different kind of areas to it you know um and it seems to have kind of uh, picked up a bit you know i mean like the red scare girls seem to have really made a sort of um a kind of impact i'd say on um on the culture you know to some extent um yeah, I'm, I'm happy to see things like that um uh, you know I, I probably wouldn't be online if it wasn't for people like them you know um and it's really like um it's really contributed a great deal to the development of my own thinking about things and it's helped kind of provide a shape and structure to it um so yeah it's, it's very exciting to think where it goes it's very easy to get kind of pessimistic now especially with the kind of like techno inevitability <laughs> um rhetoric that we were talking about earlier um but it's also very clear that like you know, people have these feelings and impulses, um, and they can be, they can only be su suppressed uh, for so long before they start kind of resurfacing in other areas, you know, and I think Twitter is an area where they, they've been resurfacing. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, it's, it's a place where, you know, people just just you know type in one one little word that they're curious about and then the the whole <laughs> accordion of uh, of discourse pops out at them and yeah um it's 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 great for discoverability you know if whatever people are curious about there's just some there's some anonymous guy posting about it <laughs> so it's yeah it's i don't know it's i think it's to me it's definitely the the best medium i've been on um but yeah, there's obviously also down, downsides to it. It's really addictive. <laughs> I can attest to that. Yeah, I've, I've had, a, had a problem with that myself. Uh. Yeah, but it's also <clears throat> now I kind of have it where, you know, I kind of have my sub stack and I'm, you know, also promoting my podcast. So I'm like, yeah, you know, this is this is my side hustle. This is my only fans. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> this is what I'm supposed to do. The market demands it. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it's a it's it's a it's a bit of a weird space, but it's also kind of it's almost mandated by coronavirus, you know, because you know my my yeah. public square is closed and I have to wear a mask in it. So um, this is my my kind of my opt-in public square, and you know I'm yeah. really enjoying it. I need some form of socialization. <laughs> yeah, it's like a, a participatory decameron that we're all like contributing to in a small way. Yeah, yeah, that's a that's a really nice way to put it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm going to have a look at my notes cuz I had like so many things I wanted to talk to you about. Um so I've been kind of doing a lot of run on se run on sentences. Um Yeah. So, yeah, I hope I haven't been rambling too much. No, no, you've been you've been great. No, I'm 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 just I just don't want to let people down cuz they've uh, they've asked me about it. Um yeah, there's just one thing here about kind of like family bonds and I know you you were posting something about you know people choosing their families and kind of having these um yeah yeah these kind of this this is the future you know you don't need to put up with your your crotchety old uh, your, like, problematic <laughs> granddad exactly the trump voting granddad you can choose your family now and you know you're uh, i feel like you're a little bit skeptical about this possibility or yeah um yeah i, I mean you know it's like it's just saddening to see i think it's like this the total effect of all of these like you know because the, you see stuff like that all the time um and with the capital um the castle capital riot there was this like thing of you know kids like ratting their parents out to the fbi which is horrific <laughs> yeah um and and kind of incredible um you know I don't think families are, are perfect, you know, I just think it's just, it's part of life that you, you know, you're in this 
situation with people who are imperfect and you have to find ways to um to live with them and you have to you have to respect them um there's a kind of there is something like precious about these things and it's like i you know the real reason why they're easy to sort of um devalue is is because they don't provide instant instant gratification they require a lot of work and patience and tolerance a real tolerance of uh, other people's foibles you know and you know obviously people have like political disagreements with their families and and things like that but it what, what's like saddening is just this complete like devaluing of the family as an institution altogether um that it has no again it's that sort of scientific thing there's no transcendent or metaphysical meaning to it or there's no like there's no cosmic enforcer to say you have to respect your granddad even though he posts like pro-trump facebook statuses um and you know there's like people take that absence as the limit of um what could be you know there's no sense of like that bond being something that you contribute to you know and that you you like construct over time i mean when you accept this premise that like um sort of so much of what appears to be reality is just socially constructed and you can just remove it right you're implicitly adopting this idea that like um the business of civilization is about removing obstacles um rather than building new things you know there's no like sort of constructive dimension to that so yeah you know like <laughs> it's, it's really like you know granddad maybe um tedious or irritating um but like you should you still shouldn't like screen cap yourself owning him for clout <laughs> you know it's like it's bad for your soul to do things like that <laughs> you know it really is like it's corrosive to you like it has a kind of lasting effect um because then it's something that you've always you've you're always going to be someone who did that yeah. you know yeah how how tied into um kind of this rise of, of therapy culture this rise of just like labeling psychic phenomena uh or like psychological phenomena um do you think it is cause I, I don't think necessarily it's causal but it seems to me like that they're they run in parallel like i know so many people who have just <laughs> diagnosed their parents with personality disorders and um you know everyone's in therapy and you know when you go into yeah therapy the therapist will probably you know if they have a at least one psychoanalytical bone in their body they're going to ask about your family and they're going to uncover things that are terrible terrible trauma that has wrecked you since you were a child uh and that you know that you can now use to detach from your family because you know if it's if it's if it's just a relationship that's not serving you that's not sparking joy you know why should you even engage with it yeah yeah well you know it, i think it de sort of depends what like the object of the therapy is um i you know there's this kind of like like meme idea of therapy of like oh you know men need to have therapy why won't they have therapy um and it, it's kind of like you know i think that that's part of a wider thing really to do with like the way men are talked about at the moment as like people in need of this kind of behavioral intervention and management uh, especially with regard to things like emotions um where like men are always presumed to be like really deficient in being able to express themselves emotionally which i think is kind of you know I, I, you can find men who have trouble expressing their feelings um but it it's i don't think it's anywhere near as sort of prevalent i think it's kind of a myth that it's like the default mode of masculinity that um people have but i'm getting away from the therapy thing um so it you know it kind of gets touted as this like almost like technocratic fix to problems with people's behavior and there's this idea of like you shouldn't go into a relationship unless you've like gone to see a therapist and sorted yourself out you know so you have to like prove yourself prove your worth within this like meritocratic system of like doing work on yourself and and all this kind of thing before you can you know dare to have like a kind of relationship with someone and 
you know, all these things, they seem really like, they seem like ploys to, ironically, ploys to evade vulnerability, you know, um, because when you go into a relationship, you do make loads of mistakes, like everybody does, and you kind of, you know, um, fall on your face all the time. And, you know, you learn what it means to be in that place with another person. And that's the thing that you kind of build and construct together over time and you make mistakes um i mean i think that's one thing like the, you know the culture seems to be very hostile to people making mistakes you know there doesn't seem to be much room for people to like to breathe and to actually be vulnerable um as much as it's like it's sort of promoted as the best way to be i don't think people are really honest with themselves about the sort of um the actual risks and stakes of what it means to be vulnerable. You know, I, I sort of, you know, I, I sort of see that like everything that I write is like really um, in the service of like vulnerability. <laughs> you know, I think it's so important, um, but it, the way it's like promoted in the media is so glib and so kind of like callous. Um, to you know there there are times when it's not appropriate to be vulnerable um there are times where it's not appropriate to share your story you know and there are times when people are relying on you um and if you like foreground your own experiences then um (laughs) you know you won't do a good job of like um of uh being able to look after them appropriately yeah It, it feels like everyone's encouraged to just, um, you know, take a take a megaphone and, um, you know, kind of exhibitionistically show off their their, you know, kind of peel back the layers and show themselves their trauma, their, their trauma. Exactly. Yeah. Um, but no one's listening because everyone's preoccupied yeah. with doing the same thing. Um, and I feel like, you know, it's vulnerability is is really important in context and it's in the context yeah. of trust yeah. so it's, it's how you build trust with another person but if you're in a in the midst of a transactional relationship which we are not only yeah. encouraged but told that okay this is the relationship format that you can get now then um you know why should i stick around for you yeah. to be be you know well, feeling your soul back yeah well it seems like there's a kind of insufficient reckoning with what it actually means to you know embrace hedonism right which is is necessarily sort of selfish and is making your own pleasure the ultimate kind of um object of everything you do which just it just necessitates a kind of pragmatically callous attitude towards other people you know where you you shield yourself from getting too invested in them and i, I you know i just think you you can't have it all you can't have um you can't have like total openness without also having um true vulnerability and you can't have um true vulnerability whilst also engaging in these like you know transactional (laughs) um kind of cold relationships with people you know that i've just been reduced to their sort of bare bones of people providing services and and i think people even treat like relationships and dating like that um and it, you know it's terrible it's like it's, it causes so much suffering to people i think and I, I don't think they a lot of people feel like they don't have any other option and they're like in this rat race of uh you know have to like date as many people as possible or i have to like have sex as much as possible before i'm dead you know it's it, all this stuff it just it stacks on top of itself you know it's it, we live in like a crazy making culture you know, everybody has to live with these like psychological contradictions that are foisted upon them by the sort of predominant cultural narratives um, that, you know, you need to be vulnerable. You need to be open. You need to be, but, you know, also be completely for yourself and like, don't care about other people, <laughs> you know, and try and like acquire as much just pure pleasure as possible. Um, and, and try is, to, yeah, to not interfere work. with uh, not not interfere with anyone else's you know yeah. life. Don't yeah. don't get involved. Don't offend. 
don't say something you shouldn't say um which i also think you know I keep bringing up this this you know anecdote that you know growing up here in, in at the intersection of countries and like you know at the edge of an empire, uh, there's a lot of like you know ethnic small little ethnic tensions with, with people around me, um, and you know the, the the icebreaker joke with someone new in the group is usually to make a joke about their ethnicity. Um, that was the thing, and if you could feel yeah. comfortable about that and say, oh you know you're Hungarian, you we know I don't know. <laughs> can't even remember exactly why I used to make fun of Hungarians, but there was there was kind of a, a suite of things you could say in that situation. Um, and you would just, you know, he would laugh and I would be like, ha ha, okay, we're cool. And then they would say something about me being a gypsy and everything would be fine. <laughs> <laughs> you know, everyone would be fine. But, you know, that you need to kind of do these, you know, you kind of have to have, to have these like vulnerability concessions from someone to, to kind of inch, inch towards each other to build that trust. Um, and, and I remember when I when one of my jobs in London, which was actually a really good job, great team. Don't want to don't want to say anything, but it was one of these companies who was really, you know, had made a really big effort to, uh, to to have you bring your whole self to work to you know. Oh you yeah, know. yeah. Show up with vulnerability, and to be honest, it it kind of pushed everyone into this weird false consciousness situation, where yeah. no one trusted each other. It was quite this like you know almost like eunuchs at the at the court in in Istanbul in, in the 1400s. <laughs> you know, every, everyone was scheming. Everyone you know, yeah. everyone had to pretend to trust each other, and it was really really strange, really weird. Like I I, I left yeah. at one point because of that, and. You know, just just you can't engender trust by decree. We're not going to say, "Oh, we are a trusting company." Yeah, yeah. That's not how. But I mean, works. that's when you've decided that, like all of the kind of uh, you know accepted like uh, routines for doing this are actually like attempts to just control people and be mean. <laughs> like all all the like the kind of ways in which you build trust in a relationship by you know, committing yourself to a person, for example, is like you know seen as kind of antiquated or unnecessary. Um, then you know what are you left with i mean i think that's like the maybe the crux of the denial is that you can have you can have like vulnerability without trust you know without like feeling i mean, i don't think people realize what a kind of precious and rare thing that is to be able to be with somebody and just actually be completely secure in um in knowing them whilst also you know, um, recognizing their ability to change and develop and grow, you know, um, and not feeling threatened by that. It's not something that can come from nowhere, you know, and a lot of these, like, you know, things like marriage that are just now seen as like purely like economic transactions again, which obviously they've always had that dimension to them, but, um, you know, I mean, I think I suppose monogamy in general is really what I'm talking about. Um, they're just like, there's no scientific reason for them. <laughs> you know, I mean, I'm sure you could make some like Evo psych argument for why actually, you know, there is a scientific reason, but that's kind of irrelevant. It's like, that's completely not the point. There's a sort of like a positive element to the, the social construction of things. I mean, t in my view, things are socially constructed because they kind of need to be. I mean, that's my own, like, metaphysical personification of what's going on. And then they revise themselves over time, you know. And it's this successive development of self-consciousness. Um, and we've been through the phase of, like, abolishing everything. And I think that, you know, it's... I mean, not to flatter myself, but I feel like the next, you know, the people in the know recognize that this has been exhausted and we now have to sort of rebuild. Um, yeah, like, oh, sorry, I've lost my, lost my train of thought. No worries. Um, it actually leads me, leads me well to, to my next question, which is essentially a, a request request from our mutuals <laughs> that um, if, if you have any kind of, recommendations you have kind of a something something to to give our listeners 
um, to, to kind of nudge them in the right direction? Is there kind of like a, a, a mantra or a, a thing? Because, you know, um, the, the person who asked us said that you were a very good diagnostician, um, but could you could you give some prescriptions? <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, there are kind of lots of areas. I think, um, I don't know if I have a kind of um, a sort of snappy sound sound bite uh, that I can give. Not that she was asking for that. Um, but uh, yeah, I think, you know, it's really important to um, to know how to be in conflict with people authentically um, and how to still respect them and still, uh, still love them, even if it's like a family member or a person you're in a relationship with. Um, I think there's like, there's a tremendous fear of conflict and it's kind of taboo um and it's you know it's difficult like it's something if it doesn't come naturally to you which i think i don't think it does to a lot of people who've been especially men who've been raised to be very kind of agreeable um then that's a very important thing um i mean you know the whole like uh like like go and exercise and stuff. <laughs> I think other people have said this on your podcast before. That's definitely not bad at all. Um, and reading is very good as well. Like just read, especially difficult texts, like reading old literature from the you know Renaissance or like the Homeric epics, things like that. Um, that is, can be life-changing. You know, reading the romantic poets can be life-changing. Um, that's not, you know, maybe, when we were talking about therapy, this is something I should have said, like, you can just kind of read poetry. <laughs> and it, it sounds kind of a bit like um, ridiculous, but, you know, you'll find, you'll find things that resonate with you. And, you know, I think reading a lot of like, a very good literature, and, it, you know, it's like the highest kind of uh, level of like cognitive, um, cognitive function you know and the more you engage with it the more it like shapes your own ability and expands um it expands what you can conceive of and your sentences will gain more like elasticity you know and they'll have more like room to fully systematize things and lay them out um you know and you'll like de you'll develop the ability to see nuances in things you know, like aesthetic nuances and spiritual nuances. Um, that sounds a bit vague, but, you know, really you just have to do it and and sort of discover what I'm talking about. Not that I'm an expert at it or anything, but, you know, just if you can just gain more and more, like, verbal and mental flexibility, that can have a tremendously beneficial effect on you because it enables you to get out of, like, um you know negative thought patterns and like bad sort of loops um and then also you encounter the aesthetic sublime which is absolutely real and you know don't let anybody tell you that it isn't um and that can't really you know can only really be approximated in words um ironically although it's often found in them um it's it's just something that you have to encounter and you know it, it, it's good for your soul mm, yeah that that sounds to be honest i mean the, now that that you you say it it sounds like um you know something you've engaged with a, a lot because that's that that's kind of the feeling that the way you write about things you know that the kind of um the, the multifacetedness of of how you look at things i feel like it, it probably ties into into your passion for you know poetry or you know, kind of older texts um, and I feel like it, it, it expands um, your possibility to opt out as well, because a, a lot of what's what's going on right now is essentially the, the mental enslavement by narrative. Um, and if you have yeah. the, the, the narrative tools yourself and you kind of see the underbelly of what's, you know, what's, what's being presented to you, you see it for how it feels. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, that's one thing. I mean, you know, uh, amidst the sort of like just the, uh, the horrible shit that's all around us all the time, you know, like, and uh, this sort of like 
um, you know, ecology of narratives. They're always competing for our attention and trying to sort of win our assent to things um, in like slightly covert ways, very covert ways, actually. Um, you know, you can't necessarily, it's not easy for everybody to like exit society <laughs> altogether and go off and, you know, start a homestead somewhere as wonderful as that would be. But you can kind of, um, you can avoid being like captured by these narratives and you can avoid letting them um, sort of define the terms in which you conceive of yourself, which I think happens to a lot of people. I mean, that's what's happened to incels. You know, incels, there's a, a sense in which incels, to just like loop back to the first thing we were talking about, were, you know, manufactured by society for a purpose, which was to sort of create a visible scapegoat for its failures to provide opportunities for satisfying relationships for young men. You know, there are all sorts of like, um, you know, social, um, and sort of systematic factors that are responsible for that like phenomena. But as long as you have this like folk devil that you can project all of that onto and then sort of symbolically exclude from the acceptable bounds of society, that's, um, that's a kind of a form of human sacrifice, you know? And I think what happens a lot is like people are, are entangled within these like narratives and the narratives have been produced to do that. Um, and you end up being instrumentalized in the service of an agenda that's not even, you know, clear to you. You know, you're, you're just an incidental part of its functioning. Um, and it's, it's degrading, you know. And I think that people acutely feel degraded, even though they can't identify why, you know. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I feel like that 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 definitely hits a nerve. There's kind of this this weird, it's kind of nebulous quality to this we, this anxiety that everyone's living with. Um, you, you don't really understand what it is that has has a hold of you, but it's it's there and it it, it never leaves. And I feel like that's also part of what's funneling people into therapy as well, because it's. You know, these yeah. people, most of them have anxiety disorders or depression or things like that, which is exactly what you'd expect uh, with narrative overload and yeah, just yeah. kind of frying your circuit circuits every day just by just by existing. A lot of like mental health awareness stuff as well is a kind of way of like naturalizing those feelings and and sort of um, framing them as if they're just a natural part of somebody's identity, you know. So if yeah. someone has like little identifiers on their, like, um, you know, Twitter profile, like dash depressed dash or whatever, it's like, and they'll do posts where they're like, oh, I'm so depressed. And, you know, that can be a way of like, um, really like obfuscating the fact there are things you're doing that may be contributing to that. You know? Yeah. yeah this um, is... or, or that there are problems with the entire society and culture in which you live that contribute to that, I should say. I mean, it's not entirely your own responsibility. You know, I don't want to make it sound yeah. like that. Yeah, of course. I feel like it's the same case as, you know, as fat acceptance. It's the same case as, you know, normalizing sex work. You know, these are these are symptomatic things that you know, happen because of other emergent phenomena that coincidentally, a lot of companies that fund these rights movements tend to profit from. You know, yeah. almost miraculously. Um, yeah. And, you know, the, every every year with every new dysfunction, we get a new rights movement. You know, people maimed by by yeah. industrial equipment will be the next one. <laughs> it's... Well, I mean, it's a, it's a kind of a narrative that I think people people are addicted to. Well, there, there needs to be some obstruction to a social energy that needs to be removed. And the social energy is personified as a group. And when we run out of you know of groups uh we have to like manufacture more and I, I think this is really what like identity politics is about i mean I, or on, on one level it is is that's the the means by which it works kind of is this like endless manufacture of new um oh, new consumer identities basically i've said that before like a lot um that you know 
um, and as they move further away, they get more abstract. They get further away from things like race, you know, um, they kind of, um, exist more as like constellations of like, you know, clothing items and like objects that this, the kind of imbue the wearer of them with this like identity. Um, you know, I, I think that's like, that's a very concerning thing as well, because, um, you know, obviously everybody is enmeshed within these sort of systems that classify them as different things and that determines the way in which, um, they're treated a lot of the time. Um, but that kind of nuanced understanding of identity has really been lost under this, like this idea that everybody has a kind of, um, you know, a tiny little person inside their forehead, <laughs> you know, and um, what needs to happen is like that tiny little person needs to be brought into like, you know, you need to act more and more like him, <laughs> basically, you know, you need to like express him as much as possible. And that is like a total phantom that's been created out of, you know, out of nothing by like, by culture, you know. Um, yeah. Exactly. And, and if there is no, you know, we, we've kind of uh, gotten rid of the of the rigid chains and, and shackles of our of our tradition and all the things that we kind of iterated through the, the millennia yeah. to get to, um, you know, that doesn't mean like the that the that the tiny person is going to be just free and there's going to be like, you know, writing poetry and, and frolicking in the street. Um, it means that they're confused, that they're alienated, and that they're they're grasping. They're just continuously grasping for something. Yeah. Well, it, well, it also shows how like um, removed everybody is from any kind of positive use, um, you know, uh, that they can they can like contribute towards something bigger than themselves. Whether it's like relationships you know, with, with like a, a partner or, you know, a wife or a husband or like a family or, um, or just something even bigger than that, you know, or art even like great art. Um, people are like sort of totally estranged from that. And so the relationship they have with themselves and their, their actual expression of themselves is kind of like a person, um, you know, selecting custom skins in like a, in like Call of Duty or something, you know, yeah. it's just like this um, endless like self customization. Exactly. And the idea that, you know, everyone's a work in progress, which is kind of this, uh, this concept from, you know, self help therapy, whatever boomer culture that you you're just you know you're just one small improvement away well, you're one skin away from achieving the authentic you. Um, and you just have to go to one more retreat, go to, to one more therapy session, um, and you, you're on your way to, to, to getting there. But that's, you know, it's just chasing the horizon. You're, there, there, is no, there is no destination on this journey. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, the same thing is discovered by people who'd, who'd like try and adhere to the sort of red pill thing too uh, rigidly. You know, it's because they just internalize this like set of game rules and then try and follow them perfectly. And, you know, the life itself will always like exceed any, any kind of like, um, system of rules designed to organize it, you know? Mm. Um, I mean, that's, that's how we got into this mess. So, <laughs> um, you know, you have to like, uh, I mean, that's the other good thing about reading is that like you read so many different things, especially things that will disagree with each other. And eventually you can develop this kind of little mini council chamber in your head, you know, and have different sort of like, um, sort of like the, the ghosts of history give their verdict on uh, everything that's happening to you. And like, they can have disagreements with each other, 
you know. And I mean this in a metaphorical way. I'm not. Yeah. I'm not actually yeah. insane. Uh, <laughs> no, I, I I didn't think so. But it's 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 an interesting thing because once once you immerse yourself in and you know the the teachings of others and the voices of others, especially like you said, if they're they're quite varied and kind of like an eclectic mix, it's not even that you're you're kind of having this this council. They're not talking to each other. You kind of internalize that lens. And then you can use it, and then you can overlap it with a with a different type yeah. of lens, and kind of yeah, create, yeah. You're, you're cultivating instinct, not even that. It's kind of like cultivating taste. You know, you kind of have yes. a taste for truth yeah. at one point. Yeah. It's like your you, your directions better. You improve your direction with with every every iteration. Yeah. Well, it's it's a building of the self, and I, you know that is something I do believe in. For for all that, like I critique individualism. Um, you know, I do believe in this sort of like the, the sort of slow um, construction of yourself over the course of your life through your actions um, and also just through like your kind of developing self-awareness that you nurture through um, through good deeds and and through like um, you know challenging reading and through making a life you know and through the relationships you have with people yeah yeah, that's that's a a, a lovely um, yeah a, a lovely focus point essentially. You know, if uh, if if I could make a recommendation, that's probably sound pretty similar to that. Um, before I, I let you go, there is one show question, which I forgot to warn you about, but it's, it's okay. essentially um, it's it's not a complicated one. It's essentially about. Um, do you know a subversive thinker or book or you know, piece of culture, and it sounds like you do, <laughs> that people should uh, should maybe read more of or know more of or, you know? Oh, that's a good question. Um, well, I mean, I don't know. People who kind of know me quite well won't be surprised by um, this answer. Um, but, I mean, a person who had, like, a tremendous influence on my own thinking about um, in a number of areas is um the singer david thomas of the american rock band pair ubu um who are you know I, I in my opinion really form the kind of um the unacknowledged center of the american rock music canon i know a lot of people disagree with me about that um i would just say like uh you know he is somebody whose work is um and his band's work is endlessly rewarding um and you know, endlessly um, and truly nourishing to the soul. <laughs> um, and he also has a number of um, kind of writings um, that people can check out. There's a book of kind of adapted lyrics called the Book of Hieroglyphs, which also has some essays in the back that are very good. Um, and he has a few other books as well that are kind of ostensibly about the making of albums but actually also contain a lot of kind of cultural commentary. Um, he, yeah, he, um, he coined, he, well, he may not have coined it, but he's certainly popularized its usage. And I kind of borrow it from him, this term media priest. Mm. And he has a kind of, um, uh, he's a great like music critic and theorist of rock music. And there's a sort of wider um, dimension to his thinking that develops on that into this kind of critique of like the entire sort of media complex of like journalism, you know, and news. Um, and he is absolutely prophetic in that way. You know, I mean, he, he coined this term data panic. There was a Peribu album called, or an EP called data panic in the year zero back in the seventies. You know, and the entire concept of data panic is like people becoming kind of addicted to this endless information wash that keeps them uh, focused on superficial things. And, it, you know, that's that's a real sort of like visionary, uh, visionary quality that he has to be able to foresee something like that. You know, So, yeah, check out Per Rubu and uh, David Thomas's writings. Yeah, that's that's definitely new to me, so I definitely will. Um, it's it's been it's been a blast. I, I thank you so much for for coming on. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I had loads of fun. Yeah, me too. I mean, it's um, 
you know, it, it really travels well, you know, you know, in, in terms of, um, of how you write and how you speak. And I also, you know, I, I always like to, to discover that someone's from, from England because I really do miss England a little bit. Uh, now yeah, that there are a few of us. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I've heard, so I've heard. But, you know, when, whenever you kind of have, a, you know, an, an anonymous account on Twitter, you're always a bit curious to see where, where someone's from. But, you know, I do still, still have a soft spot for the English. So, so thank you for coming on. Obviously, not just because your English, but because uh, because it's, it's been a pleasant surprise as well. Oh, thank you. Yeah, thanks very much.